Shirley Trias, Take One. Um, maybe we'll just start out with, with some of your general memories or impressions about what the Depression was like here in San Francisco in the middle of the decade, in the 1930s. I don't remember it's getting really serious until after 1932 or 3, in spite of the fact that the crash had occurred in 29. And um, almost everyone <clears throat> that I knew at that time, uh, no matter where they'd been before it, were picking up their bags of groceries and uh, receiving some kind of uh, help. And it was a huge percentage of people who were doing that. And by then I'd left home, so all my friends were in that condition. Was there any work <clears throat> Not that you could find, because people would get some jobs, perhaps washing windows for 20 cents an hour. But that wouldn't be, they couldn't do it every day. It, it, they just t stumble across it. I had a job where I worked for a couple of weeks for a tailor, and he gave me my car fare. And it seems to me it was something like, it was 10 cents an hour. And then I certainly have worked for 25 cents an hour. Could, I mean, put that in some sort of perspective, <clears throat> what do you think it would take? Because that sounds like nothing now. Could you barely live on it? Could you survive? Or what would it take to live on then? Well, those things didn't hold you up for very long. And, uh, but of course, that was a time when you could get a, a five-course dinner for 25 cents, including wine. So that puts it more in perspective, or you could get bread for five cents to eight cents a loaf. Now, you weren't born here, you came from somewhere else, right? Yeah, from Oakland. Yeah, so uh, the, the Bay Area in general was all the same soup, it was... Oh, definitely, yeah. mm-hmm. But I was in San Francisco for yeah. that period. Um, in 1934, as, as, as well as people getting in trouble, there, there was a lot of activity in San Francisco, that was the year of the general strike. Right. Did that really affect the, the climate of, of the city? Well, it was unheard of. I don't know where they've had a total close down like that since, of a whole city. And I don't, I don't know if it would have happened somewhere other than San Francisco, except for that times being hard and uh, uh, the tremendous amount of feeling I mean, emotions were very close to the surface. And uh, it was an astonishing thing walking around the city, and there was absolutely nothing going on. There were restaurants that were delegated to remain open for people who depended for their food on restaurants. And they'd be, uh, say, 15 blocks or something apart. And nothing was running, streetcars, nothing. It was shut down. It really was. And that was impressive, believe me. Did it seem to you as a young person that, that, that this was an important step that, that in terms of working people organizing and somehow taking some control over their lives that, that the strike helped these things? Oh, I thought it would go on from there. It really looked to me as though that would be the only solution to the situation as it stood the economics and so on, I couldn't imagine that it could go on from, from selling apples on the corner in, in 29 or 30. That was supposed to be a solution at that point uh, to the point where they have the general strike. And I thought that it would go on and that the general strike would bring a, about a lot of settlements that didn't really occur. But it kept up some momentum. That was what gave San Francisco the labor reputation for being a labor town. That's really where it started, wasn't it? It might have been there before, but that's when I became aware of it. Now, 1934 was when you got a job on a public art project, which was a rather important event. Maybe you didn't play a significant major part in it, but it, Clay Tower was the start of workers, art workers working for the government. Well, there was a period before that. Um, in 33, it was possible. They were giving jobs through PWA. And I had, um, maybe it wasn't more than two or three weeks. There wasn't any guarantee that if you happened to land one of those jobs that this was permanent employment because they would come and go as the uh, government would... Uh, 
in a very experimental way, trying to put some kind of forms together. How did, how did the general proposition that the government would put artists to work strike you? Did... Well, of course, I thought it was a grand idea. You say, that's one of these cases where I say, of course, I thought artists getting government jobs was a grand idea, because it doesn't mean anything to the people who are listening to this. Um, getting jobs was a grand idea for artists. It, um, I suppose there are drawbacks um, to having artists. I mean, people are struggling around about it now. If you, if you get uh, endowments, should you paint what they want you to? Well, you have that sort of a hang up when you begin having. Well, that was but going back to 1934 in Cory Tyler, the, the issue of what artists would paint when they were working for the government was, was alive then, wasn't it? It was it was in there, and there was a lot of effort uh, to uh, do something different, too. A lot of people would deliberately do what they wanted to do and see if it would fly or not. Sort of push the limits. Mm hmm Sure. Yeah. And did it, was it, how, how did you feel in terms of your own life starting to work as an assistant on Clay Tower? Did that seem important to you? Did it feel like, like you were part of something that was really... Important. Oh, it was a, it was an absolutely wonderful job working there, and very unusual in the sense that you don't usually have artists working together. They tend to be a little more isolate, and uh, it was a very short job, actually. It was only because a lot of work had been done previously in studios, and I didn't do any work on that. So it was a matter of a couple of months or more, and then it was incredibly painted. Did, did it strike you that, that there was something special about artists actually contributing to society or painting for, for an everyday public as opposed to for museums and galleries? Did that, was that an issue for you? Well, we'd had Diego Rivera here before this started, the uh, public works, and he had done a great deal of the work in Mexico. He'd already done a number of murals there. And that uh, that sort of established, in, in more ways, I, I think I realize now than I did then, um, the way it was going and attitudes toward it, and that it was... Uh, Kind of of the people, by the people, for the people program instead of uh, just doing it to uh, keep people off the streets. Now, one of the one of the criticisms that was leveled against the artists and the theater workers that that uh, when people tried to do relevant art, they were the the usual way to discredit was to say that it was a, a communist movement and that communists were doing it and it was somehow un-American. Did that did that happen on Coit Tower? Did that Oh, it happened. It well, happened. What's um, the response to that? Well, there was a conservative element, and the press was very conservative, and uh, the Hearst papers were well known for being very conservative. So the and then, but there was a lot of union backup and a lot and this high feeling that I've mentioned so that you could have some pretty good conflicts and arguments going on then in, uh, in regard to how far you could get with your radicalism. Well, I mean, the, the, I guess what I'm asking you was, were those legitimate attacks or those, was that just a way to try and discredit what you were doing? What artists were doing? Well, I think that depends upon the part of, point of view that, uh, that the uh, people who didn't like it were maintaining. And uh, my dear mother really didn't think that this was appropriate appropriate way for good people to be acting, that they should do as they're told and sit and stay and everything. And not paint controversial art. Right, right. After all, they're paying you and you're making all this uproar. Uh, because it's, it's a theme that runs through the decade. Whenever anyone didn't like it, it was... Communist. Now, let's move on a little later in the decade. Um, how, how did things feel, say, in 38 and 39? Were, were things getting better? Was the Depression over, or was it still bad? Um, there were jobs to be had, and they were 50-cent-an-hour jobs. 
the, I don't remember when they started on the bridges, but there was somewhere around in there, maybe as maybe even as early as 37. And those made a lot of, of simple laboring jobs for a lot of people, just preparing the approaches to the bridges and things of that sort, so that it loosened up there and in other places too. So things looked like they were getting a little better. They got a little better. Well, the, the, as soon as people were having enough to eat, you could see that the radicalism faded in exact relationship to, uh, to how much they were eating per day. Do, do you think Treasure Island and the fair was so thought of as something that was going to help the local economy? No, no. Okay, let's, let's cut. Every, this, the cameras only take... Take two. Um, we, we got to 38, things getting a little better, but I want to backtrack um, back to 37. Well, even earlier than that, um, WPA, I think, started in 36, and it, was, it, was, it helped people a little bit, but it wasn't a lot of money. How, how would one get on WPA? Could anyone get on? Well, it was a matter of application. I can't, I can't remember that well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was very disorderly, really, in the sense that I was married to someone at that time who had the job and had an accident and couldn't work on it. And I just went out and did it, just walked in and did it. And eventually it worked out that I held the job. And I didn't apply anywhere for anything on that. It's just like you're standing there, so you sit down and do it. But I mean, in general, you'd have to, you'd have to be relatively poor to qualify. Oh, you? definitely. Yes, you'd, you'd have to be a lot more than relatively poor. You'd have to be flat out broke. There were people who had supervisors' jobs, and they were not destitute, uh, but they, they didn't make very much money. Their salaries weren't much, but they didn't have to be without anything at all. Um, um, in, in 1937, there were, there were some major WPA cuts, and people got laid off. Do you remember any of that at all? No, because uh, I'm... The atmosphere was that you might get laid off any time. It was this, there was always the cloud that you might be laid off. And there were always rumors that next week or next month uh, there would be cuts. And uh, you'd never know if it would be you or not. And I knew people during that process where they'd get laid off and then get back on again. Um, but it meant that one never had the slightest sense of security about the job, whatever one it was. Did you ever get laid off from any of the jobs? No, I didn't. But you knew people who were laid off from the job. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. it, had no, it had nothing to do with my virtues, though. It, it just the way it fell. It's pretty arbitrary. Mm -hmm. um, was, was WPA enough to live on? Could you survive? Well, obviously. <laughs> Or did you have to take a second or a third job? Or? There wasn't any second or third job at all. There, there, not, a, not a chance of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the 18 or $20 a week, I think it was running somewhere around in there. I'm not that sure. But that covered a lot. Because I remember uh, for a period of time in 34, we were renting a room on Montgomery Street. And... Uh, the rent was around seven dollars a month, and uh, so you can see if that's all you were paying for rent, you weren't supporting a car, and you didn't pay insurance, and you didn't pay Kaiser or something like that. Right. Mm. This was a lot of cash left over. Mm. Um, let, let's go on now to, to when you were at Treasure Island. That, was that a WPA job too? Were you hired back, or did you stay on? How did you get the WPA job? At the well, I got requested because I had a friend who was doing a mural there. And they frequently had the power to choose their own gang because you would be at some other kind of a job on WPA, art project. <clears throat> and if you were requested, then you'd be transferred. And that's how that one came to me. Although I'd had... Before that, I'd had a job where I was sent by the lithographic project to demonstrate lithography at the fair. One of the things you were, you were telling me before is that, is that you had a, you, you, one of the things that happened at the fair that made you uncomfortable was this sense of patriotism or 
militarism. Is that? It was there and it was growing, and you could you could that's feel it. Those places where I want you to start over again. Say, what was there? What was growing? Well, it seems to me that. Uh, Perhaps it was every day at noon and at five o'clock or some regular time when a band would start out and there, there would be a great deal of playing of the Star Spangled Banner whereupon everybody would, almost everybody, would stop and take off their hats and do whatever other ritual they might be going through to respect that. And there was, the feeling was there throughout the country, I think, but where I was, it was certainly there, and it was at the fair, too, that uh, the tensions were rising, and there was a lot of uh, military activity going on in the world, and uh, the, the degrees of dissension about whether this country would go in or not go in was quite a factor even then. So it was, I thought, very, very apparent. I could feel it a lot. And what were your own personal feelings about about the threat of war or participating? Well, I'm very anti-war. I always have been, and so I didn't appreciate this very much. I didn't. Um, I felt very uncomfortable with it. Were there a lot of people who shared your view? My friends. Yeah. I thought it was a lot of people. <clears throat> when people thought about war, what were they thinking about? Were they thinking about Europe or the East? Where did they feel the threat? They were thinking about Europe. They were thinking about Hitler primarily. And then we had had the uh, war in Spain also. And there wasn't much of a dip from that military activity, which was kind of a little showcase job in a way, uh, to move right over into the further military activity. So this, this was a dominant thing. It rose in when? 30, when did Hitler start talking up so that we heard him here? I can remember the first time I heard him on the radio and it scared me a lot, <laughs> the sound of his voice. So this was a steady thread running through there and it was just increasing steadily. Was there was there a sense that we could stay out of the war? Did people think that was possible? Yes. Definitely. Don't say yes, say people thought. People. <laughs> the uh, people really thought that it was possible not to go, and there were strong movements so that you, it, it would get a lot of attention in the newspapers and so on. It wasn't just little tiny little sections of people who felt that way. There was a dominant feeling that uh, against going into the war. And it was a constantly rising. And it kept rising, and uh, I, everybody knows how it was nudged on over, but you can see just going through the years how it would build there. Um, let's go for a second. <clears throat> how, how are we doing this magazine? Mark III. Um, something else was going on in 39. I, I wonder if you were aware of it or if, if you thought it was significant. Um, Harry Bridges, the guy that had led the general strike in 34, uh, went on trial. Uh, the government tried to deport him for the first time in 1939. Did that, did that mean much to people? No, oh, it meant a great deal because there'd been 34, but there was also the strike in 36, the maritime strike. So what did, what did them trying to deport Harry Bridges mean to you? What did it represent? It represented a, an expected attitude toward him, but it seemed because he had done a great deal for the city and for a lot of union members, so that to begin picking on him in that way was really, it was like uh, a persecution and certainly didn't seem justified to me. Did it, um, some people, I wonder if you agree, but some people have said that, that they, they saw it not just an attack on him but as an attack on the labor movement in general. Did you see that? Right? Oh, I, I think I, so. I, I, I don't think that attacks on the labor movement ever stop. As a matter of fact, except that in at that time, um, things like that would would have a lot more oomph to them. 
So was it an issue that really concerned people in San Francisco? Yes. There were, there, there were ever so many people who had very strong union feelings at that time that you certainly can't find a trace of now. I don't know what it is. Is it 20% or something less than that? Maybe it's 15% of um, union membership anywhere now. So that's, and at that time, it was a very strong pro-union feeling. And hence, pro-union meant pro-bridges? It... Pretty much. Pretty much, it meant support Harry, too. I mean, the, the union people didn't buy the fact that we'll kick him out because he's a communist. They thought there was something else going on. I think so. I don't know exactly when it was. It may have been in 36, but I heard Harry Bridges in a debate with Mayor Lapham in the uh, Civic Auditorium in San Francisco. That place was absolutely jammed with people. You couldn't possibly find to see it. I've never, I don't know when I've seen so many people in one place. And it was absolutely electric, and that was the feeling, that uh, intensity of uh, union feeling. And anti-union feeling was right at a peak in that place that night. And, and then in 39, they went after him. I mean, did people, again, did anyone see that coming? Did they did they say, oh, they're going to settle scores with Harry, they're going to get him one day? Or? Well, I, I think so. They would know that he would be pursued for as long as he was uh, influential at all. Um, give me some, some general feelings. Uh, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, let's stop the change. <clears throat> Back at the whole decade, how how do you think, or what what do you think FDR did? Did did Roosevelt really help the country and bring it together and get it through a crisis, or just muddle along? How do you feel about Roosevelt during the period? Well, he was the man for the job at the place, and uh, I think he might have done it otherwise. And I didn't like him, uh, but I. I believe it took someone with enough gall to bring off some of his moves to make any kind of sense out of the condition that the country was in at that time because they were, when you have trouble on the streets, you really have problems. And he made some very, very bold moves and got away with it with a tremendous amount of protest, of course, but installing the eight-hour day was uh, an enormous move where everybody was used to everybody working 12 hours a day. Well, that means you put on it, no matter what business you're running, you put on a third man or woman. You know? So in general, you, you see him as more of a positive force than I think it was. I think he was necessary. I think the things he did were necessary at the time. Not all of them, but I. It's hard for me to imagine what would have happened without him. And if I can't even begin to think about, was there another way to handle it? Well, one of his decisions once we got into the war, which seemed appropriate then, has later become much more controversial. Which was the the decision to remove the Japanese from the West Coast. Do, do you have any feelings about, about that process? Oh, I have lots of feelings about that. What you think about that. Um, I had uh, some connections with uh, organizations who were generally opposed to the war. And um, we were able to take in a person, a Japanese person, uh, so that she wasn't shipped off. We kept her long enough that she was able just to go to the East Coast where there was no such stuff going on. And uh, it, it was a astonishing that that was done. I can't imagine, well, in retrospect, you wonder how did they ever get away with it. And I still don't know how they got away with it. But they did, and this lasted a long time. And I was at the YMCA in Japantown, and the day that, that, that most of them were evacuated, 
And here are these people carrying bags, things wrapped up, say, in a blanket. That was all they were taking, what they could carry. And it was, it was a perfectly awful thing to look at. Just perfectly awful. And, and uh, it happened. Um, some people we've talked to have, have tried to explain that, that I just, that we didn't understand how tense things were and how fearful people were. Do you think that explains it? No. No, I don't think so at all. I don't think that explains anything. And there are all kinds of rumors would go through as to, uh, Oh, Japanese boats running up and down the coast and doing this and doing that, and all kinds of things that never were proved, or tremendous amount of propaganda that I feel was fed in in order to make this move possible. And of course, this material was never properties and so on. These, it was never returned to the people. And... Um, I mean, the loss for all of them was tremendous. Um, Perfectly good citizens. Yeah, these were American citizens. Yes, uh -huh. sure, American citizens. People who, who really agree with you point to, to a long history of, of anti-Japanese feeling in California that said that people were just looking for an excuse to do that. So you, would you go that far? Well, there would be some people who would be looking to do that. But you can say that any time about a minority. When I was a child, there was a lot of feeling against the Irish. My mother had no prejudices except Catholics. And if Irish were Catholics, then they were out. Well, you can't. What are you going to say about that? No, that's true. But I mean, for example, do you, did you ever see prejudice expressed against Japanese before the war? Or was it? just something that occurred after Pearl Harbor? I didn't see it until it was uh, propagandized. And then you saw it everywhere, right? I saw a lot of it. Well, when you look back at the whole experience, the whole decade, how does it, how does it strike you? Does it strike you as good times or bad times? What period are we talking the about? The 1930s, the whole depression, from, from the crash on up to World War II. Well, I think probably because of my age, I thought it was tremendous because it was very exciting. It was very difficult, but tremendously exciting because it looked like big things were happening and all of them looked good to me. The war didn't look good to me, but there was opposition to the war and I could feel good about that. My mother didn't feel good about any of it. and. It was considerably later that I could look at her particular position and see that they were her worst times. And they were physically difficult for me, but for her it was the loss of everything she'd worked for. Um, my father lost a, a, a large accumulation of property that had been his life work. And it was just, and then he died conveniently for him, because I don't know how he would have made his way through all of the depression. It was terribly hard on men Do you think to see that country, happen. Do you think the country changed from living through that experience? Was it a different country in 1940 than it was in 1930? I think so. I, th I think there were, I think from that time on, people were very much more for their own interests rather than any group interests. And I felt I saw a degree of um, moral deterioration that really shocked me. The degree to which people had grabbed what they could get for themselves. And it wasn't true when people were hungry, but it was true after all the war money and all of that came in. Because people were quite kind to one another when they were all hungry. But things did change during the war. It changed radically, tremendously. And then the whole nature of the population in San Francisco changed because of people coming from other places to work in the shipyards and so on. It did change a lot. But that was, that was sort of diversity, right? That was bringing in new faces and new cultures. Okay. Um, I think that might...
test five. Go on. Go ahead. Uh, that child, a child, was born, my first child was born in 1942, and um, economics were such that they were extremely tight then, and to find $50 for a child to be born was, uh, you really looked around and go and ask relatives if they had a couple of 20s sitting around somewhere. Uh... And I was pregnant at a time when we had the total blackout and had to run around and put up all the curtains and we got all the uh, leaflets telling us how to deliver ourselves in the bathtub. And uh, that does sharpen up your vision of life. Nobody went out and ran around and there were people to see to it that you didn't do that. Wardens running up and down the streets. You were telling me that uh, that you were trying to find work during the war, but you didn't want to take a war job. No, I didn't want anything that that had really anything to do with the war. And it was very hard because it seemed as though almost everything was connected with it somehow. So I went to work for a liquor company and did photography for them, and uh, that worked out all right. So it was your principles. Trying to make my principles work. Stop here. Yeah, I was just trying to see the Good old shit. You were saying it was an exciting time. It was a very exciting time, and I really wish that there were enough people now who realized the condition that this country is getting into now so that they could do more reasonable things rather than having another war to make it. Uh, so that's economically the, that's feasible. The people say, well, we got out of that depression with World War II. So people tend to think well, some people got out of it. Right. Well, I mean, when you try and explain it to people who weren't through it, how, how do you make that reality? For them? I, do, I don't think it's possible unless people got as hungry as, as they were then because it, it gets um, really means something in your gut. When you're hungry and your kids are hungry and you can't feed your pets and so on, and you you really feel as though something has to be done. And when I hear people now saying something has to be done, it doesn't have the same ring because they're eating. And I think that's probably where it's at because then uh, there was there was an awful lot of hunger and very short meals. Ten cent can of tuna for two. 